Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Kane, director of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. This is the first and only museum dedicated to telling the story of the history, practice, and challenges of American diplomacy. The museum is made possible through a public-private partnership with the Diplomacy Center Foundation, CFC number 30585. The foundation is our philanthropic partner that fundraises for the museum's programming, construction, and exhibits. And to learn more about how you can support the museum, I encourage you to visit diplomacycenterfoundation.org. Due to the pandemic, it's kind of quiet here in the museum at Harry S. Truman Building in Washington, D.C. But what you see behind me is only a glimpse of what is to come. The full museum will reach into the State Department with exhibitions that highlight the honorable practitioners of diplomacy and the international relationships that have been forged over many decades. One such honorable diplomat is Richard Holbrook, who was a key negotiator involved in the Dayton Accords. We're expecting a wonderful conversation with our guest about this shining moment in the history of American diplomacy. And thank you very much for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diplomacy After Hours. I'm Dr. Allison Mann, the public historian at the National Museum of American Diplomacy. Today's program is about the 1995 Dayton Peace Accords, which led to the end of the three-year war in Bosnia. Some of you may be wondering why the negotiations to end this war occurred in Dayton, Ohio, a city almost 5,000 miles away from the conflict itself. We'll address that question today as we discuss the diplomatic road to Dayton and the skills and tools U.S. diplomats used to bring the three Balkan leaders of Serbia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Croatia to the negotiating table. We'll also take an in-depth look at what happened during those critical 21 days at Dayton's Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. With us to help unpack how American diplomats use their skills and tools of diplomacy to conclude the Dayton Peace Accords is Ambassador Christopher R. Hill, one of the key players in the negotiations. Later, our director, Mary Kane, will speak with Dayton City Commissioner, Matt Joseph, about the Accords' special importance for Dayton and the cause of international peace. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Hill to the program. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to this conversation. Well, we're so thrilled. And as a historian, uh, you know, to have you here, you know, to tell me about your personal experience will really help me as I work towards the exhibit for our public when we open our museum. But to help us with this program, let's have a few slides on the screen so we can walk through what led up to the Dayton Peace Accords. So Yugoslavia is, of course, formed after the end of World War I. So by the time you arrive in 1977, I think it was, I have to ask you, did you wonder once again what you had gotten yourself into when you met Ambassador Lawrence Eagleburger and his uh, mean tennis game? Well, uh, Ambassador Lawrence Eagleburger, uh, I guess early on he had, uh, you know, they kind of kept an inventory of who knows how to play tennis because uh, inevitably the, he, you would get a call saying the ambassador wants you on the tennis court in 45 minutes. So, you know, you rushed over to the tennis court and, and there he was. I'd never seen uh, him in uh, shorts before. Uh, not a great sight, but uh, it was interesting. And then, then uh, you you really didn't want to play on his side in the doubles match because uh, inevitably it puts a lot of pressure on you to make the right shot. And then if he ever missed a shot, he was quite hard on himself. He'd inevitably throw this uh, aluminum racket, this Wilson T2000. Always remember it. And he'd throw it and made this kind of whirring noise, you know, not unlike some incoming missile uh, in war or something. And you would just hit the deck because you didn't want it to hit you. He was never aiming it at you, but then again, he never aimed the tennis ball very well either. <laughs> he, was just, he was an amazing individual and his, his understanding of the situation, he spoke the language. I mean, he was the, uh, he was, uh, the only foreign service officer to eventually uh, become Secretary of State. Well, clearly he found you very impressive because he took you under his wing and he must have been impressed by your agility to duck a tennis racket coming at your head. So I'm sure that <laughs> made an early mark. Yeah, as if my life depended on it, you bet. 
Oh, so before we uh, go on to the next slide, if I could just ask you a quick question. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating that this is your first assignment in Belgrade, and you were also in Belgrade in 1980 when Marshal Tito, the authoritarian leader who had ruled since the end of World War II, dies. Was there any um, indication on the ground or in diplomatic circles of what was later to come in 1991? When you stop to analyze it, when you thought to yourself, how can you reconcile a situation where people in Slovenia are paying so much for people in the South? There were all these, uh, you know, the South of Yugoslavia was very poor. Uh, Slovenia was relatively rich. Would Slovenia really want to stay in it? A lot of questions like that. And you could see, um, you could see the war clouds uh, beginning to gather even as early as 1980. But by 1991, there was kind of a sense at this point with this uh, crisis looming in the Balkans, a crisis that was basically born of the fact that many of the peoples of Yugoslavia worried that Yugoslavia was increasingly becoming sort of Serbo-Slavia, Serbia being the largest of the uh, six republics, and very concerned that the Serbs were kind of seeking to, to dominate the structures there, and feeling that they would do better off, uh, do better on their own. And it was one thing when Slovenia uh, left, uh, because it's pretty ho homogeneous uh, pro uh, province there, or republic rather, uh, but it was another thing when you started to get into the heart of Yugoslavia and uh, Bosnia, if you look at a map, it's right smack dab in the middle. And there's a sense among the Serbs, wait a minute, this is historical Serb land. They can't just leave the way the Slovenes are left. So you could see this was going to be a big problem. It all worked for a long time, as long as Serbs living in Bosnia were part of the same state as Serbs living in Serbia. But when that state disintegrated and when Bosnia was going to be an independent country, and uh, you recall as well, the Europeans had said, Bosnians, you have a, uh, a, a uh, referendum and whatever you decide, we'll support it. And so there was this idea, well, if there's going to be a referendum, uh, surely that's fair. And surely the Serbs living there, the Croats living in, uh, in Bosnia, of whom there are some 20%, and the uh, Bosnian Muslims, uh, Bosniaks, living there, surely if there's a majority of people who say they want uh, uh, Bosnia as an independent country, that'll be okay. Well, they did get that 51%, they did get that majority, but uh, very few Serbs joined in that majority decision. And indeed, the Serbs said, okay, war's on. And that's when it uh, really began after that referendum. A lot of other causes. I don't want to just say it was the referendum, but uh, the referendum was, a, I think, a key event as you're looking at the, at the start of the most difficult and most bloody war of Yugoslav succession, the Bosnian War. So this picture here, if we could just take a look at this, is in the Situation Room. It was taken in March of 1994, and uh, this is the President's Cabinet, and they're getting a briefing on the situation in Bosnia. So um, there might be some familiar faces here to our audience members. Um, we have, for instance, you, then UN Ambassador Madeleine Albright um, is sitting to the left. We also have the National Security Advisor Tony Lake uh, to her right, Secretary of State Warren Christopher, of course, the President, and then to the right of him is the Secretary of Defense Perry and the Joint Chief of Staff, um, uh, Chairman John Shalkashvili. Uh, Can you say that for me? Shalkashvili, yes. That's a tough one to pronounce. So you can see that he's got, he's got military, uh, you know, here he's got his foreign policy experts. So can you tell us a little bit of, um, you know, what they would have been, you know, learning about what's going on in the Situation Room? Because it's a very, um, you know, it's in black and white. So you already have this kind of, you know, somber, there's this, this gravity, you know, to the situation that we can see. So can you help us understand a little bit about what would have been going on? An issue that was beginning to come up as early as uh, 1994, and they may have been discussing it, may have been looking at some of the plans here, was the issue of if the situation gets so bad for Umpafor uh, and that the, the, they have to be evacuated, that would necessarily involve having, uh, having US forces there. 
at a certain point, there's a lot of pressure on political pressure in the US to have something called lift and strike. And this was the idea that, look, this embargo against arms uh, shipments to Bosnia is disproportionately hurting the Bosnian Muslims because the Bosnian Serbs were getting lots of arms, as I mentioned uh, before, to the, from the Yugoslav army. The Bosnian Muslims were getting nothing. So the concern was, what if we started supplying arms to the Bosnian Muslims? Well, that would be a violation of the UN, UN arms embargo, not something we wanted to put ourselves in a position of doing, but it would also be highly problematic because as the arms start flowing into the Bosnian Muslims, then surely the Bosnian Serbs would attack them before they got their, they got their uh, trained up and got uh, well equipped through imported arms. So this idea started emerging in the U.S. Congress called lift and strike. We will, we will provide, we will abolish the arms embargo, but in so doing, we will begin to, we'll lift the arms embargo, hence lift, and, but in so doing, we will also bomb the Serbs so they can't take, take advantage of the time in between. Well, it sounded a little better in, a, in a, a speech on a Sunday morning talk show than it did in real life. It's not so easy to arm someone and then be bombing that person's, uh, you know, the, the other side that's going to now take, uh, you know, start all, all out war. So the question really was, all right, lift and strike isn't really going to work. What are we going to do? And the Clinton administration really grappled this right into the summer of uh, 1995. Well, what's really interesting and striking to me, sir, as you were talking is, there's not a lot of talk of diplomacy here. We're not there yet. We're not there yet with diplomacy. Now, I did mention we had various groups, usually European, like David Owens and, and uh, uh, Cyrus Vance was paired up with various Europeans. So this was diplomacy, but it was diplomacy without any force. Um, and uh, diplomacy without the sort of backing of force uh, is, is not going to be very strong diplomacy since the parties on the ground were not ready for diplomacy. Certainly the Serbs were only ready for them for diplomacy insofar as they had already grabbed 80% of Bosnia. The Bosnian uh, Muslims, being the real victims in this, were certainly not interested in diplomacy. So diplomacy needed to be delivered in, in a sense where diplomacy would lead to, a, to an outcome agreed on. And it wasn't until later in 1994 that they had something called the contact group plan where they agreed that Bosnia shall be a federated entity. It'll consist of two parts. And uh, the one part will be the Serb area, the other part, the Croat and Muslim, what we call federation. So that was beginning to gel in 1994. But the real issue was how was this going to work? And to give that, uh, that Muslim uh, Croat, I say Muslim because that's what they were called at the time, Bosniak, we would say today, Bosniak Croat uh, uh, Federation. Well, there was going to have, the Serbs weren't going to give all that land back. So there were some real problems with some of the early efforts at diplomacy because it didn't, didn't at all match up to the situation on the ground. So I think too, I'd like to emphasize that to our audience um, that the diplomats are always there. The diplomats are there before, the diplomats are there during, and the diplomats are there after. Um, you know, which I think uh, is a truism, you know, for so many issues and conflicts that go on around the world. Well, let's move on um, then to 1995. And let's uh, go on to the next slide and talk about, um, you know, what would Americans have been seeing on their nightly news? Um, certainly, a lot of them had been tuned in in 1984, uh, as the Winter Olympics were held in Sarajevo. And, um, you know, the, the picture down that we can see there below is part of Olympic Village. And that was the skating rink where in 1984, many Americans proudly watched Scott Hamilton win the gold medal for men's figure skating. And to their abject horror, and really I think to the horror of the world, 
Olympic Village was then turned into a graveyard as the siege just wore on. And then, of course, to the left is this very iconic um, image of, of this building, you know, just in, in, in flames and the devastation and the, the snipers um, and how many days it was just going on. So certainly I would think that the administration would start to feel some pressure from, from that to do something, to take some kind of action. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, uh, in American diplomacy, what is the role of American public opinion on determining uh, foreign policy? Well, certainly um, the media have played an important role in past wars, no question about it. If you look at the Vietnam War, there was more and more media images coming back to the United States and people being kind of horror struck at what was going on. But what happened in Bosnia was that we went from six o'clock news to uh, 24 hour news. Cable television came along mm -hmm. and uh, media outlets increasingly stationed their, uh, their reporters in the middle of these war zones all over the place. Uh, certainly uh, CNN's name, I think, uh, having started during the, the war just a couple of years before in the Gulf, became even more famous when they, they covered the, the Bosnian War with such uh, iconic uh, journalists as Christian Amanpour and others. So Americans saw this terrible conflict in their living rooms, not only at six o'clock, but at every hour on the hour. So there was a sense that something had to be done. And uh, the concern, of course, from the diplomat's point of view, was that it's not simply a question of let's send the cavalry in there and let's wrap this up, because the, the complexity of the situation was far more than many people understood. It sounded like you were going to need some powerhouses uh, in this crisis. So, uh, you know, let's just take a minute to, uh, to talk about two of these central figures in these negotiations, Ambassador Richard Holbrook and also Ambassador Robert Frazier. Um, so you, sir, were Ambassador Holbrook's deputy. Can you tell us how that evolved? Well, first of all, I was, uh, I was the head of the Balkan office. Uh, under Ambassador Holbrook. And what happened was in September 1994, uh, for whatever reason Holbrook wanted, he was restructuring the Bureau, the Bureau of European Affairs, and he wanted someone new to uh, take over a number of these offices, and he particularly wanted someone new to take over uh, Bosnia and the Balkans because he understood that that problem wasn't going away. And probably if you look at all of the European landscape at the time. Yes, there was NATO enlargement, absolutely a vital and important uh, um, development in those days. But really, everything would look a little hollow if we didn't have a solution for, uh, for what we're going to do in the Balkans. So um, he had decided he wanted uh, uh, to make a change and to have new people come in. Um, he didn't know me and I didn't know him. But that morning I got on a bus and I was uh, uh, on the bus and I was sat down next to uh, the principal deputy assistant secretary who happened to be on the same bus, uh, Ambassador John Cornblum. So rather than talk about sports, I talked about the future of Europe with him. And so we spent 45 minutes on the bus that day. Uh, we got into work. I went down to my office. I was dealing with the northern part of Europe at the time as a deputy director. And then uh, I learned later that Holbrook said to uh, uh, John uh, Kornblum, I need you to find someone to lead the Balkans. And uh, Kornblum said, I've got just the guy. And so that night uh, I got a call to go see uh, Ambassador Holbrook in his, in his darkened office. So I walked into his office, he asked me to sit down and he's got a little, little television set uh, on the side and he's watching the NBC nightly news. And then he uh, turns to me and says, well, what do you think of the changes I've made around the Bureau? <laughs> I think he wanted to get my opinion of what I thought of changing the office of Northeast European Affairs. To Wait, your opinion or your approval? I think he wanted the latter rather than the former, <laughs> but he did ask the former, but you gotta know what the real heart of the question is. And so I was deciding whether I wanted to just say it's brilliant, sir, or whether I wanted to change the subject. 
And, but before I could answer, uh, he went back to the news and he unmuted the news and uh, went back to that. And so he's listening to literally to Andrea Mitchell, who was on the news. She was filling in that night. Uh, and then uh, he uh, muted uh, with his mute button. Uh, he muted her and turned to me and said, what should we do in Yugoslavia? <laughs> I started to answer because I had given a lot of thought to this issue. And then he pointed the remote at me and muted me. And he got a little confused between whether he should be unmuting the television or muting me. I stopped talking as he turned the television on. John, John Kornblum came in and Holbrook said to John Kornblum, okay, I'll take him. And so it was like a done deal, it sounds like, before you even went in. Uh, Holbrook was a very impressionistic guy. So I look at Kornblum, and Kornblum said to Holbrook, good. And then I look at Holbrook, and I said, that's great, but uh, what are you going to do with me? I mean, what, what do you mean you're going to take me? And then he explained what it was. So um, Bob Frazier, who's depicted here in the slide, he was out on a trip. But he was the guy that I was going to be working with more than John Kornblum, who was the principal deputy. Uh, Bob was the deputy assistant secretary for uh, the Balkans and Eastern Europe generally. So I, I was able to get to him a few days later and we were able to get together. And we became great friends until he died just uh, 10 months, 11 months later. So Ambassador Frazier had been ambassador to Estonia before he was appointed to try to go negotiate with Slobodan Milosevic, then the president of, of Serbia in, in, in Belgrade. And I just want to uh, read a quote from your book um, that, that's really, you know, it, I think it speaks to him having just this, you know, really great sense of wry humor uh, that he said to you, that uh, one of, well, first you note that one of his great skills were that he could manage the anxieties in Washington, and yet he can still, you know, work on the ground with this, with this difficult person. And that of Milosevic, he said to you, a wheelbarrow full of those talking points wouldn't work with Milosevic. And the talk of points meaning bringing him to the negotiating table, unless you hit him over the head with it. So certainly, I think awareness is a school is a skill of diplomacy that diplomats often need. You got to know who you're dealing with and what will work with that person. So could you tell a little bit more of, of about Ambassador Frazier? Yeah, I think uh, Bob was a kind of guy who led from the front. Uh, he didn't just uh, sit in an office in Washington and just read reports. He went out and figured out what was really going on. I think that's why Holbrook hired him uh, because Holbrook was the same sort of person. And so uh, Bosnia, if you sat there as a sort of intellectual uh, and played an intellectual game of how do you solve Bosnia, and you could come up with some solutions, but it didn't really matter unless you really heard from the people on the ground and why they would be in favor of something, definitely not in favor of, of other things. So what Bob objected to was people who wrote uh, uh, talking points that we were supposed to use with uh, Milosevic and that somehow Milosevic would have some epiphany. He would hit the side of his head with the palm of his hand and say, oh, now I understand. You're absolutely right. I'll completely change my policy. That's a very powerful argument you've given me. Okay, deal done. Bob understood that's not the way it works. You have to develop that relationship. Now, Milosevic was a war criminal. Uh, I mean, he died in a cell in, uh, in the war crimes tribunal uh, in, in The Hague. He was a war criminal, terrible, terrible individual. Uh, and Bob worked with him. He worked very hard with him. And uh, Bob uh, was in many ways a mentor to me because he, Bob would say, you know, I don't pick these guys. If I don't, if I could pick these guys, they'd all be English teachers from uh, his native West, uh, West Virginia, and they'd all talk about the Shenandoah Valley, but they don't. They have another uh, agenda. And so Bob really kind of drew a sharp distinction between the world of paper, uh, world of talking points, and the reality uh, of dealing with the situation on the ground, which is why he was just such a fabulous uh, uh, choice to be working on this tough issue. 
Bob understood history. Uh, a lot of Americans kind of dismiss history. It's kind of our strength in some respects that we're not imprisoned by, by uh, you know, what happened 600 years ago, but you better know what happened 600 years ago because every taxi driver in, in Sarajevo sure knew, knows or has some version of what happened 600 years ago. And Bob kind of got that, uh, he got that uh, flow and was just a, a joy, uh, a joy to work with. Well, you mentioned um, the loss of Ambassador Frazier and um, in that tragic accident on Mount Eggman in August of 1995. And Richard Holbrook was in another vehicle with Wesley Clark, who's in the photograph to his right. Um, and two other diplomats were lost that day, Joseph Crusell from the National Security Council and Colonel uh, S. Nelson Drew as well died in that accident. And I wanted, if you could please just speak about the skill of resilience. Mm -hmm. how, how do you go on to complete the mission in the face of such a tragedy? You know, you, you, you're uh, awake at night, you're up early in the morning, you're grieving really. And then you say, well, we're gonna make this work. And you just, you know, you talk to your colleagues. Holbrook played a big role in, in helping us summon the courage that you needed from within. And so out on the road, we went again, just a week later uh, and uh, resolved to get this done. This is one of the reasons why the National Museum of American Diplomacy is so important to open because we want our visitors to really understand that it's service and sacrifice to the nation. You know, it's not just a job <laughs> that, you know, there's some real uh, dangers and loss, you know, that, that accompanies this. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that about Ambassador Frazier. Could you move on to the next slide, please? Um, so, uh, you know, for a lot of our viewers, they probably might not be familiar um, with the folks in this picture, um, the, the leaders of, of the Balkan nations, as well as Secretary Christopher. And um, could you just spend, uh, you know, uh, just a couple of minutes, uh, you know, telling our audience, you know, how do you as a, as a foreign service officer, as a diplomat, how do you manage? Because management is a, is a skill, you know, not, it's a skill in business, but it's also a skill of diplomacy. How do you manage all these different personalities? Well, uh, first of all, they are different personalities, extremely different personalities. So to understand personalities, you've got to go on receive mode. So uh, in kind of sketching these three people out, uh, none of them was particularly democratic. Uh, certainly not Milosevic, but neither were the other two as well. But they wanted the best thing for, uh, for their people, whether for uh, selfish reasons or whether for a broader reason about how Muslims could exist in Europe or whether for a historical reason to put aside these historical rifts that uh, 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 for the Croats had suffered by. You got to understand this stuff. You really got to understand it. And you've got to avoid buying into cliches about things. These things are complex and they, you can't just say, well, you know, they're all just a bunch of nationalists and that's that. It's far more complex than that. And I think a good diplomat spends a lot of time studying the other side of the chessboard rather than just his or her own side. Interesting. So there's a barrage of airstrikes, you know, and uh, commencing. And, uh, you know, finally, there's this agreement that everyone will come together and they'll come together in the United States. And I think it might have been an Ambassador's Holbrook, uh, his book, where he said when Milosevic found out that he was going to be, you know, stuck in the middle of America, that he screamed something like, you can't lock me up. I'm not a monk. Who do you think you are? Um, so was there like general surprise among everyone when they found out that they weren't going to be in some place like New York, you know, that they were going to be in Dayton, Ohio negotiating? Yes. No question. As we got into the early fall, we had the makings of a peace plan based largely on that contact group plan I mentioned that had been developed a couple of years ago. We had a concept of how to implement it, but we needed to get everyone together for what we call proximity talks. That is people in the same place, but not necessarily uh, talking directly or negotiating. We became the mediators along with the Europeans. 
So uh, the question was where to do this? Well, uh, we looked at a bunch of facilities, but we really wanted to be a pressure cooker. We wanted to get people in there, put the lid on, and not let anyone move. We, we looked at New York City. I mean, what a great place. Uh, Rocker, Rockefeller Brothers Estate, great place. But we we're worried that people would say, oh, well, I'm going to be out till next Thursday. We wanted them to come, and there was barbed wire all around Wright Patterson Air Base. People got the message. You're coming to this thing, and you're not leaving until we have a deal. So that was very important uh, to say, we're gonna do this. And then of course, Milosevic objected, everyone else was, you know, why are we going to Dayton? <laughs> and I think it was my, my colleague from the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, Jim Pardew, who said, that's where peop real people live and real people work. Oh, and, uh, perfect, this, perfect this response. Is this is America. So off we went to uh, Dayton, Ohio. So um, we can move on to the next slide, but you know it's very interesting. We haven't yet really talked about these these tools that diplomats use, and you mentioned too. So first is logistics, right? You got to figure out the right setting for what it is that you want to accomplish, and then there's that you said it's a pressure cooker, so you want to put time on it, right? So you have to have this set period of time, and. I mean, this, this is also another skill of diplomats that's just amazing, the composure here and the, the pressure of knowing that if you did not succeed in getting this deal signed, literally people were going to die. You know, as, as you came into this situation, if you did not have that deal signed, the ceasefire was done and more people were going to die. And so here you are, you've got these three leaders. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't Holbrook set it up so that they were um, in, in the same room? So they had to actually walk past each other. They couldn't avoid each other. And he called this uh, a lockup strategy. There was a certain amount of that. They had, um, we were in what's called the visiting officer quarters uh, at Dayton. And I know Matt Joseph will be able to speak to some of this uh, later. And uh, we had set up a place in, in what was the Bob Hope Center uh, where we expected negotiations to go on. It was a, pres a pressure cooker. Each head of each delegation had a suite and you'd go and meet them and then you know you you meet some other head of a delegation you get together and it was it just went on and on for 21 days and 21 nights so you had that pressure keeping your composure with the huge group but then i'm sure there's a lot of pressure like this situation that we see in this photograph right now um so secretary christopher wasn't there the entire time I, he would come in for um updates and here you are sitting to the right of ambassador holbrook as he's pointing i think that is west clark to the left too but he's Correct. he's pointing there at a map so you know, I guess going into the negotiations, it's like you almost had these small huddles on your own, you right. know, and you had to go out to the larger group and try to ascertain that situation. I mean, we used to joke about how it was sometimes like a touch football game because uh, you had to kind of figure out what you're going to do for the next play and you're kind of drawing out plays on the dirt or something. In this case, you can see very clearly we have the uh, uh, part of a map of Bosnia and uh, one of the issues was in drawing the inter-entity boundary line uh, between the Serb and the Muslim Croat uh, Federation, Bosnia Croat Federation, you needed uh, a uh, dividing line there that the U.S. military could, could actually police. So they'd want to know, okay, well, what are the roads here? Can we get a Humvee through there? How is that going to work? So. All of this stuff had to be meticulous because as, as Holberg said, there are no small problems. Uh, every problem becomes big, so you better know what you're doing. What's interesting about that photo is that uh, Warren Christopher came in a few times and uh, Holbrook wanted to get him kind of uh, uh, involved so that when we got to a final solution of the problem or when we got to a point where it was kind of make or break, he would feel kind of imbibed with it. He wouldn't just say, well, that's Dick Holbrook's problem. He would be willing to jump in. I mean, I had, I was working on this issue with uh, uh, Croat and uh, Croatia and Serbia and kind of normalizing the relationship. And I got to the point where I kind of solved it. And I, I came to Holbrook and I said, look, uh, it's all done. They're going to, Tujman and Milosevic are meeting today at five. They're going to agree to this thing. It's great. 
And Holbrook says, I don't want them to meet. I said, what do you mean you don't oh, want them to meet? <laughs> yeah. And then he, then he said, I want Secretary Christopher to do this. I said, well, he doesn't need to. I mean, he, and so Holbrook said, trust me, I know what I'm doing. So lo and behold, oh, it, was, it was painful because I, I worked for a week on this thing and Secretary Christopher hadn't heard of the conflict, of the, the particular issues there. So he had to ramp him up with briefings, et cetera. Well, lo and behold, it all came out well. And uh, even though I was, uh, you know, I, I mean, I had darker hair before that moment and, uh, and, Holbrook, uh, and uh, Holbrook kept saying, trust me, I know what I'm doing. And he did indeed because Secretary Christopher learned a lot about Eastern Slavonia, I'll tell you that. And he also kind of got with the rhythm of the program. So even when he wasn't in Dayton, he knew what was going on. And of course, at the last day, he played, paid an absolutely played a critical role in the Birchko settlement, which was the final thing. I'd just like to mention one other person in that picture next to Secretary Christopher on his right was Robert Owen, who was mm -hmm. our lawyer. And if there was ever an author of the Dayton Accords, it's Robert Owen, Bob Owen. He was in the State Department in the late 70s as the legal advisor uh, to the State Department. And Christopher brought him in again from, from a law firm, Covington and Burley. So Bob and I were often paired together. We'd go together and deal with the, with the uh, various parties. At one point, we had an idea to draw up because we weren't sure how to manage Sarajevo. The, we didn't want it to be in one entity rather than the other because we didn't think we could agree, get agreement. So we thought we'd maybe do a sort of District of Columbia for Sarajevo. So Bob did a beautiful document on Sarajevo, showed it to Milosevic. Milosevic said, no, it won't work. It won't work. And then, and then Holbrook, kind of sensing that himself, said, Mr. President, don't worry. We have another idea. As for this, whereupon he tears it up right in front of Milosevic just to say, we're going to try something different. But he's also right in front of Robert Owen and spent all night working on it. I mean, you had to have a thick skin to work through this stuff. It sounds like the two of you probably had to commiserate quite a bit. And that's another form of resilience. We talk about resilience. I mean, when your own boss rips up your plan in front of somebody else that you've worked on, I'm sure he kept his composure for the moment, but you probably heard about it a lot later. I, I did, but, you know, Bob was just, I mean, what was so wonderful about this whole thing is, you know, for all people talk about Holbrook being the bulldozer, et cetera, he had good people. He had good people around him. So, uh, and none better than Bob, and then Robert Owen. Bob Owen was fabulous. So just really quickly, sir, we'll go to one more slide and our viewers can consult our website, um, you know, about, uh, you know, the final adjudication of the, of the meeting and the signing, um, the finer points of that. But what I'd really like to hear from you, sir, is, um, you know, did these date negotiations inform future decisions? And did they, you know, what did they do for you as a diplomat? Like what, what skills did you hone and refine as you became a you know, special envoy to North Korea? Did you, did you bring some of what you, you absorbed from Dayton into your future work? I, I sure did. Um, first of all, those are a couple of pi pictures, of course, one of all the delegations together. I love that picture. I think someone ought to take that photo and turn it into a an oil painting. It looks like something out of the Congress of, uh, of Vienna, 1815 or something. And then the picture below, of course, is the various, uh, well, you have Secretary Christopher there and you have Isen Begovich on his left and, uh, and uh, Tujman on his right. I guess over, over one is, is Milosevic. And they're initialing the agreement because three weeks later, we were going to sign it. The French at first wanted to sign it in Paris and call it the Paris uh, 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 Peace Agreement. But we kind of insisted now we're going to call it Dayton and, uh, you know, not Washington, not New York, Dayton, Ohio. And so that obviously stuck. And to your question of what did this mean for me, I must say when it was over, it was like a lot of things that are over. You just, on the one hand, felt relieved, you felt gratified, and then you felt, oh, my gosh, I need to do something else like this. I can't go on without this being in my life. And uh, sure enough, a lot of other things come up that are, you know, and you, you want them to be things that don't involve people's loss of life. 
because that was the real poignancy. I mean, 200,000 people killed in this conflict, and and including people we knew like Bob, uh, Bob and Joe and uh, and uh, Sandy. I think if you talk to the Europeans who spent their time there, uh, they would describe it in the same sense that I describe it. It was very meaningful and really speaks to the fact that, you know, if you have the right people, if you have the right energy level, uh, if you have the right sense of stubbornness, that is, you're not going to leave until you nail this thing, uh, great things can happen. Well, thank you, sir. I mean, that's been wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn it now over to Mary Kane, the director of the museum, uh, who will talk to Matt Joseph, and then you and I will return to the conversation. What an amazing conversation. Um, Commissioner Joseph, thanks for being here today to talk with us about the D Dayton Peace Accords and the effect the process had on your city and its people. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been, really, it's been a pleasure just to listen to Ambassador Hill. To get us started, where were you as the events in Dayton were taking place? Actually, I was in Washington, D.C., not far from where you're sitting now, I assume. Uh, I was going to grad school at the GW, and I was a staffer on the Hill. I was a legislative assistant to Congressman Hall, who represented Dayton at the time. But you were still in touch with the people in Dayton. And during a commemoration in 2005, I believe you described it as people reacted. There was a fire in ba Bosnia, and it was brought to our neighborhood. We took our garden hoses and tried to put it out. We acted just like neighbors. That's what we do in Dayton. If they're in trouble, we're in trouble. Could you expand on that a little bit more and the feelings of the citizens and what was happening on the ground? I can, and actually it makes me proud as a, as a Dayton native that uh, we, we here in Dayton reacted that way. I've, I've seen foreign policy from a Washington viewpoint, uh, but to see my neighbors here, uh, the folks in Dayton, react to a situation like that uh, in which there was a conflict, they found out more about it, uh, people came here to talk about it, discuss it, and hopefully resolve it. Um, and they reacted to it just the same way they would if, if their neighbor had a problem, because if our neighbors have problems, and then so do we. And that's, uh, I know that might be a Midwestern attitude a little bit, but uh, in this case, uh, yeah. I thought it was very effective, and I was proud of the way that my fellow citizens did react to the, to the talks being given. Let's take a look at a few pictures, and you can, if you could give them some context, that would be great. Sure. Okay, the first picture is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, yes, it's the base. Uh, it's a big base. It's the state of Ohio's largest single-site employer. Uh, today, there are about 30,000 people working inside the gates and quite a few more than that uh, related to the base work outside the fence. Uh, it's located a few miles east of Dayton, of the city. Uh, so everybody knows the base. Um, when they announced that, uh, that their talks would be happening on base, everybody sort of nodded, or, you know, in, in Dayton, that's the natural place to have it. Uh, you know, there's a big fence around it. Uh, it has all the facilities, has uh, everything you need to, to hold, have, to keep a lot of people uh, there for an indefinite amount of time. Ambassador Hill mentioned, you see this, this square layout of these buildings. This is the VOQ. Uh, they're actually not called VOQs anymore, the Visiting Officer Quarters. So this is this is where uh, everybody stayed the delegation stayed each one of these buildings was assigned uh, to one of the delegations one was were croats one were Ser ones for serbs one were uh, for bosniaks muslims and the, the the fourth one was for the u.s delegation the eu stayed in another one just off the picture oh you can see it a little bit on the bottom left corner uh, that's the eu delegation uh, quarters uh, okay. And the base actually put a quite a bit of work into making sure that every, every one of these was exactly the same as the others. They went out and bought identical furniture, identical pictures. Uh, they knocked down walls to create suites uh, to make them like more normal hotel-like rooms. Uh, but they wanted to make sure that the delegations couldn't complain, that they all had equal everything. You know, they couldn't complain that somebody had a bigger room or a nicer picture on the wall or a better couch because they were all exactly the same. When the Serbian delegation came, uh, they, they moved their stuff in, they brought in suitcases full of things. Um, they asked uh, where they could find roof access so they could set up their, set up their uh, satellite communication equipment, which of course, these talks were designed to isolate everybody. So you know, they're, they're, that was not gonna happen. So the base commander said, no, I'm sorry, you don't get roof access to set up your, your satellite dish. Uh, the second story, the one I heard from the housekeeper uh, was that 
these delegations were very suspicious, of course. Uh, they weren't sure it was a new environment. They were worried about being surveilled or listened to, or uh, you know, they, they weren't sure what was going to happen. So uh, in the midst of getting everything ready, preparing everything for the talks, uh, the, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base personnel went and bought everything to outfit all these rooms. And Air Force regulations say that rooms like this are required to have fire extinguishers, which is common sense, of course. Um, but they didn't, whatever reason, the, the fire extinguishers didn't arrive in time. So a day or two after the talks began, the housekeepers were told to go, and when they made up the rooms every day, to put in the new fire extinguishers that had just arrived, put one in each room. Uh, but it was just a sign of how suspicious that the delegations were, is that uh, later that night, uh, every room had a, the fire extinguisher set outside the door. They removed them from the room and set it outside saying, no, thank you. We, will, we don't need this. <laughs> so they were amazed. And, and, and housekeeping, you know, they, they'd never dealt with a mass uh, uh, number of visitors like this. So they've had foreign visitors before, but to deal with these delegations in this sort of setting, they still, they still tell stories about those days here 25 years later. So I'm really interested in the story behind the next photograph, the candlelight vigils. Could you tell us about those? This, these show a couple different, uh, couple different occasions. Uh, the one on the top left, I believe, is one of the vigils that was held outside the fence, outside the gates of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is a big base. Uh, so there are miles and miles and miles and miles of fence. Um, but people came down, especially uh, ethnic Croats, Croat Americans and Serb Americans, Serbian Americans came down from Cleveland and other places in Northern Ohio, uh, some around Detroit, up in Michigan, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, a lot of places around pretty close to here within driving distance had a lot of ethnic Croats and ethnic Serbs. Their parents had come over uh, or they themselves had come over even. So they would show up and have prayer vigils. Uh, they would sit outside the gates. There was an uh, attempt to hold hands all the way around the base, which doesn't matter <laughs> because you need the entire population of Ohio. Uh, but it was, it was wonderful uh, just seeing that. And a lot of people around still remember being part of those vigils for peace. So they would light candles, they would sing, uh, and people would join hands, uh, you know, whether they were from Pittsburgh or they were uh, somebody from, from the city here, uh, and, and pray for peace and hope for peace. The other pictures you can kind of see, uh, the, the top right picture, and I believe the, probably the bottom left one, uh, were in the University of Dayton's chapel. Uh, they had a candlelight vigil there, I think maybe even more than one, to, to pray for peace. So the community really did rally around uh, the negotiators and negotiations urging urging a settlement. And the peace accords had a landmark effect on Dayton in more ways than one. Here we have an architectural and personal example of that effect. And can you tell us more about this? Yeah, I'm very proud of this. Uh, this is Holbrook Plaza. This is Memorial Plaza uh, that we began uh, just, uh, actually, I think it was just a few weeks after the ambassador died. Uh, we, we, we started planning this plaza. Uh, we worked with his widow, Kati Morton, to uh, just get an idea of what she would like and what she thought he would have liked as a memorial. Uh, she, she said he would not want anything ostentatious, and she didn't want anything ostentatious. She, did ostentatious. she didn't want a statue. One of the nice, especially nice aspects of this is in the bottom picture to the right, you can see the little wall, which is the back side of the wall that where, it's, where it says Holbrook Plaza. And you can see darker plaques on the back side of that, uh, that wall. What those plaques are and the, the dark smudges next to them are actually pieces of buildings uh, that had been destroyed in the war, but then were rebuilt. This, this top picture, this is the picture of the, the stone that, was, that came from the Stadimos, the old bridge. You can see the plaque there with a little bit of history about it. Uh, and, uh, and the plaque on the bottom was the, the one from Novigrad. This is the, the town that, that's uh, just a little bit north of Vani Luca. And uh, th the mayors were very generous in, in figuring out how, to, uh, how they can give this to us. And I have to credit State Department uh, for figuring out how to ship them <laughs> because shipping stones was not an easy task, especially historical stones. So they had to work through a lot of, uh, a lot of hoop, jump through hoops and jump over hurdles to figure out how to get those here to Dayton. Oh, and here we have more. And that's Cotty Martin, I know, because she's been a really good friend to the National Museum of American Diplomacy with um, when we talk about um, Ambassador Holbrook. She's been wonderful. Uh, we unveiled the, 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 when we unveiled the memorial, 
Plaza. She was here and it was pouring down rain. She soldiered through rain. Uh, we had umbrellas and tents and everything going on. And she, she gave really excellent remarks. She was very gracious. So you did become Sister Cities with Sari Nubo. Well, you know, just a few years after the Accords, a couple years after the Accords, uh, the mayors of Dayton and Sarajevo got together and signed the, the, the Sister City Agreement. We have had many delegations go back and forth. We've had educational delegations go back and forth. Uh, we've had scholars. Uh, we've had exchanges of all different kinds of economic development. We've had uh, city workers go back and forth. We've had uh, police training back and forth. We've had a whole list of cooperation over the years. Uh, these pictures here are from a delegation that Mayor Whaley, Mayor Nan Whaley and I led here uh, in 2016, uh, just a few years ago. And we took a, a big group. We had a group of 24 or 25. You see us here under the old bridge under the starting most and most star on the top left. And the, the bottom right picture is a picture overlooking Sarajevo from the hills around Sarajevo, which is it's just a gorgeous city. I and mean, the country as a whole is gorgeous, but Sarajevo really is very special. But Matt, I think there was a personal outcome for you, not only involving peace process, but a State Department program. Would you share that with us? <laughs> <laughs> there was. Uh, you know, there was an old saying, a very old saying, that uh, even the darkest clouds have silver linings. Uh, for me, that was the case. Uh, back in 1999, after the war, uh, you all at the State Department offered scholarships to students, college students who were going to be either teachers or involved in the justice system. Uh, my future wife got one of those scholarships and came to study at University of Dayton for a year. Um, so I met her there. Uh, she then went back home for three years to finish studies and get things taken care of. And then I convinced her to come back here to Dayton. Uh, we got uh, we got married and have a couple kids now. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to live out that very small silver lining from a very terrible war. Thank you so much, Matt, for sharing your time and your stories. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. I think we're going to go back now to Ambassador Hill and Allison. Thank you, Mary and Matt. That was terrific. Um, so, Ambassador Hill, um, you you were married <laughs> at the time that you were, uh, you know, doing the negotiations. But do you have a a, a personal story about um, Bosnia or Dayton that you'd like to share with us? Oh, I know. I remember there was something about a bar. <laughs> Matt, what's the name of that bar? Oh, well, there was a thing called Packy Sports Bar. And uh, I don't think it was the intention of the, uh, the military that configured Dayton for us, as Matt just explained, but uh, some of the most important negotiations took place at Packy Sports Bar. It was a, uh, it was a long, uh, an arduous negotiation, and uh, it happened in sometimes funny places, whether you're just walking along a walk or, you know, sitting in Packy's sports bar, seeing uh, reruns of uh, some NCAA football game. That's and incredible. What's Packy's like today, Matt? So it's still there, right? It is still there. Uh, you know, it's it's a pretty common place to eat. There are a lot of Wright-Patterson employees are within walking distance of it, so they'll go over there and have lunch. Uh, they Actually, they were just renovated. Ambassador Hill, you should come back and take a look. They had They actually had a fire but they recovered and renovated and it's actually looking very nice. So maybe less of a dive than it was at that point. It's looking good. I'm sure he misses that five-way chili. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. It, the food was great. We always loved the food. Allison, if I could, or speaking of food, that reminded me of a, a nice story that talks about uh, the citizens of Dayton. And Ambassador Hill, you may remember this. Uh, I heard stories from numerous people, including Ambassador Holbrook, that they would occasionally take uh, the principals out to eat, the presidents who were here negotiating. They would take them out to eat at a regular restaurant and not, you know, they get them off a of base occasionally. Um, and there are a number of stories, one particular about a restaurant here, a French restaurant called Mauberge, uh, where when Ambassador Holbrook uh, brought, I don't, I don't know who it was with him at the time, one or two of the presidents into the restaurant, he got an ovation from the people there at the restaurant. And uh, Ambassador Holbrook in a speech here mentioned that as something that was very special about Dayton. He said in, in Paris or, or wherever, somewhere else in the world, people wouldn't have had that reaction. But here in Dayton, it was very evident that they were supportive of what was going on. 
we could really feel the warmth of the city. And I must say, uh, the deputy secretary at the time, person we haven't mentioned, Strobe Talbot, uh, is actually from Dayton. So uh, he had come in to check on the progress and uh, he took us to a couple of restaurants that he liked. So uh, we did get a sense of Dayton, but I, I just want to tell you when you're in the middle of this thing, and you don't know if it's gonna work, you don't enjoy things as much as you'd like to enjoy things. So. Well, I, I would like to say from a personal perspective, I have a very good friend who was the public affairs officer uh, in Sarajevo in 2015. Um, that was her post. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go and visit her. And that was really you know, thrilling for me. And for our American audience, uh, as you said, Matt, what a beautiful country. I mean, we drove all through it, went to see Starry Most uh, in Mostar. And in Sarajevo, the scars are still there, you know, um, the physical scars. And I was walking down the street and I saw these red spots, um, you know, on, on the sidewalks. And I asked my friend, what, what, what is that? And she said, those are the Sarajevo roses. They are areas where people lost their lives to that war. And they filled in areas where there was shrapnel that went into the concrete. They filled it with red epoxy and they're known as the Sarajevo roses. And I had to stop and take a breath because of the enormity of how many Sarajevo roses there are. And to think that the end of that war concluded in Dayton, Ohio, with you, sir, Ambassador Hill, and so many other American diplomats and Ambassador Frazier had really laid that groundwork, makes me so proud to be an American and so proud that we will soon be opening up our wonderful museum to feature this story. I would just like to give both of you uh, our warm congratulations and you are invited to come visit us at any time. We would love it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.